All right, good morning. For the second, for the rest of you, good morning. Good morning. All right, there you go. Man, y'all getting as bad as the first group, you know. They come in here and they got up early and stayed up late and, you know, we got to, we got to get in the spirit here because this is a new year. And you know what? Wouldn't it be nice if we left here excited about Jesus? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So let's start right now, all right? Let's go ahead and get excited. Y'all give him a praise offering. So when we get to heaven, that'll be a good warm-up. Not there yet, but that's a good warm-up. I'm going to pray for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, the name that we came here to worship, the name that's above every name, God, we bow our hearts before you this morning. We bow our lives before you. We tell you, God, to speak to us as you need to speak to us so that, God, that we can hear from you. And, Lord, that this year would be a different year because we decide to make a choice this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, I love the new year. Uh, I love the first word of it, not year, but new, uh, because that means that there are some things I get to start over and, and hopefully I do better at this next year. And, you know, for you, I'm sure you hopefully have the same ideas that, you know, you get to try to do some things and everybody has their New Year's resolutions. Uh, I, per I prefer to uh, make them resolutions to God, not just to myself, all right? Because what I've discovered is, is whatever you do, if you pray and invite God into the process, then you'll have success. If you try it on your own, you're triply going to try it again next year too, okay? So in this uh, sermon, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But the other thing is, is uh, some of us, we come in here and you have strung together so many failures over the years trying to do the same thing that you've sort of just sort of resolved that, you know what, why should I even have a New Year's resolution? Because I had it last year. As a matter of fact, it's the same one I've had for 10 years. It's just the top of the list, and I just can't seem to get it. And so why even try, right? Well, if you're that person, I'm glad you're here too. Because when we get done, you're going to find out that there is a reason that we keep trying. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of um, my own story. You see, when I went to uh, Bible college, um, Thank God I met my wife there because, uh, you know, I always struggled with writing and um, with the English language. Uh, you know, it's not about speaking English. It's about, you know, what's a verb and a predicate and, and who cares, right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Can I get an amen, right? <laughs> so... I went to, you know, Angela, she was, uh, she was really a godsend because she was an English person. You know, she, she knew, the, knew all the little uh, grammatical things that you have to know to write well. And so uh, after um, Bible college, I went to seminary, and then I decided uh, to get my doctor's degree. And so when I went to uh, get my doctor's degree, um, they they we were in seminars so it's no longer like a classroom setting there's only like six of us uh, because it's specialized and they want there's two professors and you got their attention uh, so they when you when you get there though they tell you you're going to have to do a dissertation and you're going to have to write um, prolifically you're going to have to write uh, so they pair you up with one of those professors and so there's three with this professor and three with this professor, and we still do our seminars together, but outside of that, when we need uh, questions or whatever, then we go to that person. So they paired me up with the professor that was an English major. <laughs> and I'm thinking, didn't you see that my thing said graduated from Villarica High School? <laughs> I need the other guy, right? And so right out of the gate, you know, I know that this is an uphill battle. And what I hold here in my hands is the dissertation that I had to write in order to get my doctor's degree. Now, wow is the right word. Because when I first started, 
they told us, you know, you got to pick what you're going to write on. And, you know, you're really going to write what we want you to write on. But we want to make you think it's your idea kind of thing. And so we pick and they say, here's the first chapter. So I wrote the first chapter. They sent it back to me. It had more writing than I had on it. <laughs> so I rewrote the first chapter. I'm thinking, I can, this is good this time. They sent it back to me. It looked just as bad as it did the first time. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that was wrong the first time? It's like, you just find a new stuff that's wrong. And I think every time that I put the uh, words on the page, something was wrong, you know. And so I rewrote it again. They sent it back to me. So on the fourth try, I finally got the finished product of the first chapter. So I thought. That wasn't the first chapter at all. That was simply the outline for all the chapters. Jesus. Five of them. And so you can imagine the three years of my life that I spent writing this thing, how many times I got it back. So I got the first chapter back, which was not really the first chapter, and I started this process again. Guess how many times it took for me to get the first chapter right? Four. Not the first chapter thought it was chapter but the real first chapter it took me four more times uh, because again the English language and myself we have this constant battle going on and you know that's why all of you are here because uh, some of you like the fun of me not speaking it correctly and others of you feel right at home <laughs> but what I learned in this process because I'm telling you it was so laborious uh, I wanted to quit so many times because uh, I just I just apparently couldn't get it right. And uh, to make sort of give you a comparison, there were certain guys in our group. I don't think there are any ladies in this group. Uh, there were certain guys in our group that the uh, the leader over this um, particular doctoral program had said, you know, you you should be doing a PhD and not a, a D men to them. Um, because they knew how to write really well, you know. They never said that to me. <laughs> Here, we just hope you get through this. I mean, that's... And so, with this struggle that I was going through, of course, I didn't quit. I, I do have the book. Uh, I didn't quit. Uh, and it took me all the three years to get it done. And um, what I discovered was some truth that is applicable to where we are today. Because you see, when you get into life circumstances, there are always those times you want to quit, right? But what I learned is, is when you don't quit, you find out something deeper about yourself and what God's trying to teach you in that circumstance. But what I also found out though in this whole process is that until you have the first chapter right, you're not ready to write the story. And so what God was showing me that he teaches in scripture is something that's so applicable to us as we dive into this new year because as we dive into this new year, for most of us, this is what our life looks like. And this, this board represents the time that we have in a day. And this little post-it notes are all the things that we have to try to get done. And so all this busyness of life sort of um, drives us and directs us but the problem with all of this is that we can't get it all done and we don't really know where to start and so we just try to do everything and instead of having a plan the things themselves are our plan they direct our lives they tell us what to do they tell us what not to do we're not even in control and when we're not in control it increases our stress level our anxiety level our worry level and all these different pieces whether it's you know 
taking the kids to the ball game, whether it's fixing supper, whether it's balancing the, bu- balancing the budget, whether it's making enough money, whether it's trying to get a new job, whether it's going to college, whether it's uh, dating somebody and, and trying to work through relationship problems. No matter what all those things are, which are just a little glimpse of what is on the board, all those things, when they become our life and dominate our time, then we get to this place where we're not succeeding anymore. We're just trying to survive. What if, though this next year, we decide we're not going to just live in survival mode? What if we figured out that if we get the first chapter right, that everything else is easier? And so what if we step back for just a minute before we dive into next year and we figure out what God wants to teach us regarding this concept? Because it's a common concept that's all in Scripture. And the story I want to tell you about is a story you already know um, for most of you. And the story is really a picture of us. And in this story, there are two characters. And each of us is one of those characters. Forget the gender stuff. Set that aside for a minute. Seems like our society is trying to do that anyway. Uh, but set that aside for a minute because the story is about two ladies and their names are Martha and Mary. And if you've been to church any time, you've heard of them, right? How many of you heard of Martha and Mary? All right. So it's familiar. And since you're familiar with it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the background, but I do want to give you a little bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar. It's the story about two ladies and Jesus was going to come to their house one day for a visit. Now, if Jesus is coming to your house for a visit or anybody's coming to your house for a visit, what do you do? You want to make it look better than it normally does, right? So that they'll feel bad when they go back to their house. You see how clean their house was? It's a lie. We're living a lie there, okay? It's not always that way, right? But anyway, we still have that thing we want to give the perception out. And they, they, this was the same scenario with Martha because Jesus coming, everything has to be right. And I could understand that. I mean, if God's coming to my house tonight, I want everything to be right, right? So, God comes to the house, Jesus. And Mary... And Martha are both there, but Martha is so concerned because everything's not done yet. So she's, she, you know, hey, Jesus, and she's all about doing her busy stuff. Mary, on the other hand, she decides to sit down and listen. Because you see, when Jesus comes to your house, he always has something to teach you that's worth listening to. So Mary was sitting, listening. Martha's busy, busy. And Martha gets mad at Mary because she's not busy, busy. She's lazy, right? It reminds me of my four kids. Because when it, we come to house, they're all, you know, they've got one that's about to graduate this year from high school, and then they're all graduated. But, you know, when they were having to do their chores clean your room, do your laundry, and all that. They would always get mad when it seemed like one of the other siblings was getting away with doing less. And I, I mean, it's like they want to fight, but they would come to us. And so, you know, they're, they're supposed to be cleaning, but all we're hearing is complaining, you know, because this, this brother or this sister, uh, they don't have as much to do, or they're not doing anything, or their room's not. And so, you know how that works. Well, it's the same way with these sisters. They're, you know, they're, they're going back and forth. And finally, Martha says, Jesus, tell her to help me. But in his answer, the short little answer we find the truth that I think will revolutionize our life this year. Listen to it. Martha, only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And so Jesus says, listen, listen, Martha, stop for a minute. Let me clear everything out for you. Let me help you understand that Mary has chosen that life right in this moment is going to be about one thing and that one thing is not going to be removed for her because there's only one thing that Mary realized that is necessary or needed. 
And if you could get this one thing right, then all these other things in your life wouldn't cause you worry and anxiety and frustration and anger. And it wouldn't cause you to lash out at other people and get mad at them because you feel like you're doing more and they're doing nothing. And what Jesus wanted Martha to understand that we have to understand was that Mary had chosen the one thing. Now, everybody in the room that day had the choice to choose the one thing, but Mary, Mary chose it and Martha chose the busyness of everything else that needed to get done, that had to get done. And when she got to that, we all know the story, what happened, but what we don't know about the story is, who are we? Because there's only two people in the room. And when you and I walked in the room this morning, we took on the cloak of one of these people. And we're either that person that's busy, 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 trying to do everything, and we're missing the one thing. Well, what in the world is the one thing? The one thing that Mary focused on was Jesus. Jesus is the one thing that Mary chose and Martha chose all the other things over the one thing. Because all the other things at the moment seemed more important to her than the one thing. And so she was busy, busy, busy with all the other things. And she missed out on the one thing. And you and I know this story and we've heard this story. But God's trying to get it to sink in so that we understand. Listen, you can be in the room with Jesus. and still miss that Jesus is in the room. Amen? Amen? Right. So what does that mean for us? That means that, listen, we can put on our Sunday best or we can put on our casual clothes. We can come in here. We can get a cup of coffee. We can sit down. The worship can go on, be great music, great worship. And, and, we, can, and we can pray and we can hear the word preached to us and we can have all that going on. But the busyness of our mind is not even here. We're disconnected from it because we're thinking about all the things that we need to get done that are more important than Jesus. And so we can be in the room and miss Jesus. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. Without having the one thing, all the other things in life don't work. You and I will try them on our own. We do it, don't we? we? We're trying marriage on our own. We're trying to raise kids on our own. We're trying to do school on our own. We're trying to have this business on our own. We're trying to go to work on our own. And we're working, 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 working. Worry, 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 worry. Anxious, anxious, anxious. And God's saying, would you just slow down a minute? Just slow down. And listen, I'm going to teach you something this year if I never teach anything else. If you're going to clap for God, clap for God. Hey, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Because when you pitter-patter, I assume that's my clap, okay? But we're not here for me. We're here for him. Amen. And so for you and I, what God is trying to draw us back to is this concept that you and I can choose to have a simple life by narrowing our focus, narrowing what our attention's on, and when you narrow that focus, it boils down to starting at the same place every time, and that starting place is one thing, which is not a thing at all, it's a person, and it's a choice to choose Jesus over everything else. As a matter of fact, this is a thread that is tied all the way through the New Testament. It is a thread that's tied all the way through the Old Testament. It is this concept that will revolutionize our life that we've heard of before, but hearing of it doesn't mean it changes us. Hearing of it just means I have a choice to be Martha or Mary. As a matter of fact, we see this thread as Jesus was teaching in the book of Matthew, as Matthew's recounting this story, Jesus is preaching the first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew 6, 33, he gives them this thread as we're seeing it. And this thread, he, he says, listen, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. 
And so what God is trying to get us to understand in the midst of all this stuff that's going on, that we've got to look at all this stuff and we can't let God get squeezed out with all this stuff. A matter of fact, we can't even let God be in the middle of all this stuff. We've got to take God to a different place in our life. And it's not one in many. It's a place where God deserves to be, where his, his attributes, his life, his word is magnified in our life so that this relationship with God becomes the very one thing that I focus on, that I seek, and that I put first in my life. And so it's not about, God, how do I work you in? We've been living that story too long, haven't we? That was 2017. God, how do I work you in? And what God's saying is, no, 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 no. It's you work with me first, and then I'll show you how to work everything else in, and it'll work in such a way that it'll change your life. You see, it's not that, God, I don't have time to read the Bible. No, you got time for the Word of God. Tell, tell God that you don't have time for something else. Would you help him? Would you help me make time? And God will make the time that you need for something else so much shorter than when he's not in that time. And we're so frantic as people thinking it's up to us that we got to do it. We got to produce it. But what God wants us, to, wants us to see is, listen, if I would step back and just allow him to be the first thing, the first person I seek. Because don't miss this word. Seek. He doesn't say show up. He says show up and seek. When you come to church, it's not just about showing up. That's just one step in the process. That puts you in the house. Once you get in the house, you got a choice. And the choice is, is who you're going to seek. Amen. Amen. Because I really believe that our enemy has clouded our vision. And I think that's why God over and over repeats this. Because over here, he says, listen, if you will seek me first, then all these things will be added. And what he's trying to get us to understand is, is the things don't make our life. It's the person that makes our life. And we get wrapped up in all the things. We got a lot of things going on, don't we? And it's all those things that take our attention. But if God has our attention, God is not a thing. God is a person. And it's so important that we understand that about this one thing that's really not a thing at all. Because he tells us this, which connects to this thread that goes through all of Scripture. It says, Jesus replied, here's the greatest commandment, the one thing that you could do that would change everything else is to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so what God is trying to get us to understand is, is what we really need in life is not a bunch of things. What we really need in life is the love of God in our life. And when the love of God comes in our life, the love of God makes us want to love God back. And when we love God, it changes who we are and it changes the people around us because then the love of God flows through us into our marriage, into our kids, into our neighbor, into that person we have this struggle with. And love is the answer that God wants us to see is the pathway to the abundant life we seek. But if we don't have the one thing right, we won't get to this thing. If we don't have the focus that Mary had, then we'll be confused in the midst of all the other things. Because just like Martha, so are we. We're, we're good about showing up sometimes, but showing up just gives us the choice. Showing up allows us to choose. Am I gonna be about God or am I gonna be about all the things in the room? I'm gonna be about all the things that are other than God. And so what God's calling us back to this year is listen, I want to be first in your life. I want to be the focus of your life. I want all your heart. I want all your mind. I want all your soul. I want you to be so wrapped up in me that all this other stuff doesn't really matter. I could lose everything I have and I still got everything I could ever have. I can have a struggle in my relationship, but I'm still in my foundation of God because my God will lead me through that struggle. And we begin to change our perspective because God becomes our lens that we see everything through. Amen. But right now, he's not. Amen. Amen. We're gonna have to have this talk again. 
Come on. Come on. Do you know that clapping is a form of praise? When we clap, we praise. When we say amen, we praise. And it directs our attention to him. And so God needs our full attention. You see, we're, we're dress rehearsal right now, okay? And we're preparing ourselves for what's going to happen all week long. And so God is pouring into us so that we can pour into others. But if he doesn't have our undivided attention, if he's not first in this room and your mind's on everything else, then you're missing out on the most important thing. And so how do we get to this place to where we are loving a God that always loves us back? And how do we get to this place where, where we understand how to pursue him first? Because, you know, if we ask the question, well, is God first in your life? Well, everybody wants to say yes, but that's not the truth, is it? And this is not feel guilty day. This is let's be real day. So if we are this place where God's not first, then how do I get him there? Because you see, things in life, the choices of life, they have a propensity to draw us near God or draw us away from God. And so what happens is, is when we're in deep relationship with God and we've been walking with God, one decision does not simply separate me from God so often. And so I'd make that decision. I think it's no big deal. I say, well, you know, I got to do this thing. I don't have time to go to church or I don't have time to read the word today because I got to get this done. I got to get up early. I got to get moving. And so we get moving, get home. We don't have, we're wore out and we go to bed and God's been nowhere in the picture. And so that's just one decision. But when you string a year of those decisions together, the accumulative effect has a huge effect on our lives. And what begins to happen is, is the way you talk to your spouse begins to disintegrate. The way you talk to your kids begins to disintegrate. The way you see other people begins to, to disintegrate. And we begin to judge. We begin to look at people differently. We begin to hate. We begin to get anger in our lives. We begin to worry in our lives. And it's all because of the effect of all those decisions where I decided, you know what, God, God, you're important, but this is more important. God, yeah, I understand, but this is more important. And so God gets squeezed out of our lives and we wonder why our lives are in a wreck and we wonder why I'm anxious, we wonder why I'm worried and we wonder why I don't have peace. We wonder why I feel like I don't really have purpose and meaning in my life. I see this so many times. I see people have kids and the kids are grown and gone and they retire. It's like being a teenager all over again. It's like your freedom, right? We're free again, you know. And they just, they just go start doing all kinds of stuff, enjoying each other. And, and, and they get to that place and they look back and they realize something is missing. What was missing is, is that God used to be in the center of their life because they kept their family there. They kept going to church. They kept plugged in. They kept making a difference. And when that was pulled out, there was a vacuum in their life and it left a vacuum in their hearts. And so many of us are there even though we're here. We have a place in our heart that something's missing. And you're over here trying to fill it with all these things. You're plugging them in. But they don't fit. And they never will. God is the only one that can take that place. And that's why he tells us, I want you to love me with all your heart. Because I've got to have all your heart in order to fill your heart. I want you to love me with all your mind. I've got to have all your mind in order to make you think differently. I've got to have all your soul so that you are full inside and you're not walking around empty. And if you give me all that, I'll take care of all that. Amen. And so... For you and I, how do I determine what's first? Because, you know, we'll lie to ourselves. Anybody ever lied to themselves? Of course you have. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I don't want you to lie to me about lying to yourself. <laughs> so, how do we know? Well, let me ask you this. If you're married, raise your hand. Okay. 
If you've been married, keep your hands up. Keep your hand. If you've been married, but you're not now, go ahead and raise your hand. All right. So, how do they know you love them? Show them. All right, so you pull a picture out of your wallet and you say, hey, I love you. You see that? That's our wedding picture. Don't ever forget it. Do I need to show this to you again? Your actions. What you do, right? That's what shows me that you love me. I mean, you can tell me that all day long and curse at me. That doesn't make me feel loved, right? You tell me all the stuff I'm doing wrong. That don't make me feel loved. And so it's your actions. But it's even beyond your actions. You see, actions done towards somebody else require this thing we call time, doesn't it? Actions happen in time. And if you don't have time, you don't have what? Action. You might have action, but it won't be action in that relationship. It'll be spent somewhere else. So everybody woke up this morning with the same amount of time, 24 hours. And what we choose to do in that time will determine how our relationships are, right? So if you want a better marriage, you look at how much time you spend in that marriage, working on that marriage and working with that marriage. And it's the same thing in our relationship with God. If you wanna know if God is the priority in your life, ask yourself what your time looks like. Because if I don't have time for the relationship, I can't express my love for that person and that person being God's. And so for you and I, listen, we got to work, right? We got to make money. We got to go to the grocery store. We got to do all these other things. And God says, listen, if you focus your life on those other things, then your life will just become about those other things and you'll never be full. But if you'll seek me first, I'll take care of all the other things. Amen. Amen. And so when we forget, though, to give time to the relationship, then our hearts drift. It works that way in marriage, doesn't it? No time, you get separated. Listen, you can be in the same room with them, but be in different worlds, can't you? Martha was in the room, but she was in a different world. And so for you and I, what happens at that point is that our heart drifts. And listen to what God tells his church. Again, this thread goes all the way through Revelation. Listen to what he says. He says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height for which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from his place. So, Here's what God's telling the church. He says, listen, I just got one thing that, that we need to talk about. And that one thing is, is a lot of us have become like Martha and we love everything we're doing in life, but we don't love the one that gives the author of life. Yes. I want you to love me first and don't worry about all these other things. I got it. Just love me first. And he says, listen, here's, and in this passage, he gives us the secret. He says, Remember the height for which you've fallen. What he's trying to remind us of and remind the church of is that when our first love is, is sort of pushed out of our lives, then all these other things begin to flood into our life and we begin to think we're succeeding because we started a new company or we got a new job or we got more money or we got a bigger house or we got a nice car. We begin to think that we're succeeding, but what God says is that we keep falling deeper and deeper and we don't even realize we're falling. So he says, remember where you were. One of the most dangerous things that can happen to a swimmer or diver is, is that they get confused 
And instead of coming up to the top to resurface so they can get oxygen, they get turned around and they start going down further and further and they get to the place where it can be a life-threatening for them. And for you and I, it's the same way. It's the same way for a pilot. They get confused in their instrument panels. If something goes wrong with them, they'll think sometimes they're going up when they're going down because they're, they're so discombobulated that they'll crash the plane and realize, not even realize it because they thought they were going up. And what God's saying is that some of us in the church think with all this stuff, we're going up. He said, but we're really going down. That's why he says, remember the height that you've fallen from. We haven't attained height. We've lost altitude. And God says, remember and repent. He says, listen, repentance is simply understanding that this is not achieving in life, that when God is first, everything in life becomes achieving. Everything in life becomes successful. Why? Because I'm doing what he's leading me to do. I'm not doing what I'm trying to do to make myself look better. And he says, remember where you were. What am I remembering? I'm remembering what it was like when I was in love with Jesus. And listen, if you're a child of God, there's been this place in your life, in this time in your life, when you were so in love with Jesus, nothing else mattered. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you've never been in love with Jesus. So you don't know what height to fall, that you fell from because you never were there. It's an indication of where our heart is. And so listen, if I'm having this conversation with you this morning and that's where you are, then your first step is you need to know Jesus. You need to have a savior and his name is Jesus because he hung on the cross for you and he wants to set you free this morning. He wants to give you a reason to live. But for the rest of us, he's saying, listen, remember when you were desperately in love with me? I want you to come back. Because listen, you left, God never left. God says this, he said, there's nothing in this world that could ever separate us from his love. But what happens to our hearts is we get disconnected from his love. Amen? Amen. So, you know, if you and I could just simply step back the same way we do in marriage, you know, when people come and their marriage is all messed up and they've drifted apart, it happens to everybody. Listen, it doesn't take a lot of neglect to drift. You know what, I, you know, and, and some of us go get counseling and say, hey, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get our boat right because we're going in wrong directions. And so when they come together, because their hearts have sort of grown cold, what you have to do is you have to start doing the things that cause your heart to be warm. You have to go back to the things that made you fall in love. You see, sitting on the couch and watching TV didn't make you fall in love with them unless you're a TV person. Time and attention made you fall in love with them. So give them your time and give them your attention and do those things that you did before so that you'll fall back in love. And God is simply saying the same thing to his church. He said, listen, if your heart's grown cold, then do the things you did before when you fell in love with me, when you first knew me and we were, we were tight, but now you've drifted away. And if you'll do that, then your heart will be renewed. And so you gotta turn away from that and begin to pursue those things that you used to do. And for many of us here in churches, it's real simple for us, it's not complicated. We just gotta go back to some of the things that are real basic for us so that we can get back to the place where God God has our hearts. And it's really one thing that changes everything this year is understanding that God wants to be the primary person in my life that has my heart, has my attention. He wants me to choose him first every time over everything else. And so I'll have that opportunity to choose him. Does that mean I won't get anything done? No, that means you'll get everything done that's important. So how, how do I do that? Well, I don't want to sound trite. But you and I will never keep the one thing the main thing if we do not spend time reading this love letter that he wrote to us. 
Because in this, in this Bible, God tells me who he is. He tells me who I am. He shows me over and over again the, the life that he wants me to have. He tries to protect me from the life he doesn't want me to have. And who in the world would do that? Only somebody that loves me would tell me the truth, right? Yeah. And so over and over, God is telling me this. And so if you and I want God to be the one thing this year that makes a difference in everything, then the word of God has to be a primary place in my life every day of my life. And if you don't have time to read it in the morning, plug it in your car. Do something to keep this in front of you. And, and listen, if you struggle with it, keep a record of it. Write it down. We have our soap guides out in the lobby. It's on our app. Download our app. And, and just write it. Hey, you know, I, I was in the, in the Word uh, uh, four days this week or three days this week. Why? Because we're looking for progress. If you're not reading anything, start with one day. That's a huge increase, isn't it? Start somewhere. I promise you it'll change you. The Word has to be a part because the Word is the love letter that expresses God's love to me. But you know what the other piece of the puzzle is, is that God says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. He says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. He said, but let us meet together and encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching, the end approaching, because things are going to get worse and worse. And so what God's saying is, is church, you need to be together. We need to meet this is not some insignificant thing that happens every, mo every Sunday morning. This is life. This is encouragement. This is strength. This is us in our number standing against our enemy. We need this often, as many times as we can get it. And so don't just bypass church and say, you know what? Let's just sleep in. Or let's just, there's always something, right? There's always something that will get stuck into Martha's life to keep Jesus out of her life. So make it a priority. As a matter of fact, start the year off right. Commit to being here every week for the next four weeks, and then we'll talk about it again after that, okay? Amen? Yeah. Amen. Listen, I'm not asking for a better for worse till death do us part at this point, okay? Just give me four weeks. And we'll start in the right direction. Give God four weeks. But here's the other piece. When we get to church, guess what? We're just in the room. What happens with the word determines what I do in the room. Because it connects my heart to God. But there's something else that needs to happen so that we don't just stay in the room. We stay connected to Jesus as the priority. And Jesus modeled it for us. You realize when Jesus started his ministry, the first thing he did, chose 12 guys, 12 people to be with him. And these 12 disciples came together with him. And they spent life, they did life with him for three years. Why do you think he did that? Because he knew that they would grow better together than they would separate. And so he taught them. And that's why you see us promoting groups. That's why we have them out here for the next two weeks. We want you to get plugged into a group. And if you're not in a group, I know that you have all the excuses in the world why you can't be. And what I'm simply telling you is all those questions, all those excuses that you have for not being a group are not on this board. They're on that board. And so if you want to stay on this board, you got to make the things a priority that keep you on this board. And the three things that I'm telling you this morning are simple things that aren't complex. But if you put those on this board first and you work everything else in, you'll always have time for what's on this board. Amen. Amen. And if you ever hear yourself telling God that you don't have time for something that's going to draw you closer to him, then that should be an indicator for us that our enemy is trying to steal away our first love. And we're falling. We're not going up. We're falling. And so I want to challenge you this year to simply Take the step to keep God first, to keep him your first love, to keep him the one thing by taking these three time investments of his words, of church, 
of group life and begin to plug those into your life so that they become a regular part of what you're doing. And there's another piece we're gonna talk about as we move through this month, but it starts there. And so you and I, many of us, we gotta come back and say, God, you know what? I just need to repent right here because this is where I've been living. And I've, I've let this busy life squeeze you out. I've let my kids squeeze you out. I've let other things squeeze you out. And so the other thing though I want you to understand is, is you know what, sometimes, Sometimes we just need a hard reset. And if you know anything about computers or phones, I'm watching uh, TV the other day, got on the sports channel, watching a football game. I'm like, man, it's, it's not HD. It's like black and white. Everybody's sort of pale looking, you know? And I'm like, I pay nine dollars a month for HD. I should be having HD, you know, and I don't have HD. It's, you know, it's just not the same experience, is it? So I go over there, unplug the power, count to ten, plug it back in. TV comes back up. Guess what I got? HD. Some of us this morning, it's time to unplug. It's time to reset. Because the life that you've been living over here is black and white. It's not high def. The high definition life is over here with Jesus. And he's calling you back, but you've got to reset this morning and start where you are going back to him. And this is how we're going to do that together. I want to invite you to be a part of our fast. A fast is when we give up something for something else. And what we're talking about giving up is you're going to give up a habit. You're going to give up something you do so that you can focus on God for 21 days together. Some of you will do the Daniel fast. And the Daniel fast is online. There's a lot of details to it. I'll summarize it for you. If you like to eat it, don't. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Basically, you're eating whatever grows in the earth, not what grows in McDonald's, okay? So... Uh, the Daniel fast is 21 days. You can do that. That's typically what I do every year. And I try to read through the New Testament during that time period. So guess what? I don't have a lot of time for TV because I got time for Jesus. And so I read through the New Testament. You know what happens when you're saturating your mind for hours with the Word of God? You begin to think differently because God's reprogramming you. So your heart begins to drift back towards Him. And so the other thing, though, is that some of you, you want to just fast from different things, you know, like, uh, hey, I'm going to quit drinking Diet Coke for 21 days. Well, I want to encourage you, if that's what you did last year, step the game up a little bit. Don't make it easy on yourself. Listen, you know, you mean to tell you how you figure out what you want to fast from? Whatever right now you don't want to fast from, that's what you need to fast from. You're trying to hide it from God. God, don't, don't look at this one, you know. God knows what you got hid. And that's what he wants. Why? Because that's the thing that's keeping you over here. And so what we do at sundown tonight, the fast starts. Why sundown? Well, that's just sort of a Jewish custom. That's what they do. I'm not Jewish. i am just adopted this process. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, what's sundown? Some of you are going to be running out in the backyard. Honey, I still see the sun. Keep those nachos warm. I, I get it. And that's some of you extremists. You'll be like going into Alabama because you get another hour to eat, right? <laughs> we'll talk to you. You'll be all out in California because you keep running. So there has to be a place to start. So we just pick it. 21 days, whatever you choose, you choose. If you slip and fall, get up and keep running. You know what I mean? Because listen, when you first start, it's difficult. But I promise you this, you get into the Word of God, you stay in His church, you get in a group in these next 21 days, I promise you that you will be a different person. You'll see the power of God released in your life as you pray for things. He said the, this fast, it releases us from our bonds, it releases other people from their bonds. It's the thing that heals our soul. And God's saying, listen, if I could have your undivided attention for 21 days, I can change your heart again. You want to be changed? Then join us. Everybody can fast from something. If you got medical things, then you seek your physician before you do the Daniel fast. I don't want to become visit you in the hospital. But many of us can raise the bar this year. So what I want to do is I want to have a prayer commitment as we commit ourselves to God. 
as we take these steps this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we as your church come to you, God, and ask you to forgive us. Forgive us for being a Martha when we need to be a Mary in this world, God. Forgive us for all the busyness that squeezed you out, God. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we commit to following you, that you're gonna be first. You're gonna be our first love, God. We are running back to you, God. And Lord, I pray that in this next 21 days, you would release power in this building and in your people's lives that they have never experienced before. God, that you would show them what it means and what it looks like when you have our whole hearts, when we love you with all our heart, mind, and soul, God. And I pray, God, that the bonds would be broken. I pray that habits would be delinquished, God, and they would be released from it. I pray, God, that marriages would be restored and that families would be healed. I pray, God, that people would be released from infirmities because the power of Jesus is a power that's better than, greater than anything we could ever experience. God, for that person that's sitting here, it doesn't understand why we do all this. It doesn't understand why God should be first. I pray that this morning they give their life to you, God. That they realize that that is an indicator that they need a savior this morning. I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and being resurrected from the grave to save that person from themselves and from eternal destruction. And that their choice this morning can change their life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to ask you just to stand to your feet when we wrap our service up. If you want to come down for prayer, you need somebody to pray with you, or you just need to come down and just sort of lay down the, that burden you have or lay down that habit you have, our team will be down here. And if you invited Jesus into your life or you want to take that step this morning, then don't be afraid to step out and come down here as we sing this next song and worship together.